Today I want to share with you, the title of today's sermon is called, We Should Be, We Should All Be Farmers. We Should All, all Be Farmers. I don't know about you, but uh, I've never been a farmer. I've, uh, I've never even planted a little flower in a garden, so I don't know that much about being farming, but the Bible tells us that uh, being a farmer, more specifically, um, planting things, is very good. Today I want to share with you from Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. If you found it, let's all read it together in one voice. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. Let's begin. I said, plant the good seeds of righteousness, and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord, that he may come and shower righteousness Upon you. Let me read it again for you. I said, Plant the good seeds of righteousness, and you will harvest a crop of love. Plow up the land, ground, uh, plow up the hard ground of your hearts, for now is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. Long time ago, uh, a man named Chiang Kai shek. Chiang Kai shek. Chiang Kai-shek. He was a, a, a revolutionary leader of China. And his wife actually said this quote, and it was very interesting. Uh, she said, If the past has taught us anything, it is that every cause brings its effect. Every action has a consequence. He says, We Chinese have a saying, If a man plants a melons, he will reap melons. If he sows beans, he will reap beans. What Madame Chen Kai-shek was saying is simply, was repeating simply God's law of causation. That means we reap what we sow. That means good produces good, evil produces evil. For every action, there is a reaction. Now, that is God's law of causation. In some ways, what this is saying is this is that we write our own destinies during our lives on earth. We become what we do and we reap what we sow. And let me say this, the belief and the understanding of this fundamental truth can greatly affect how we think and what we do. Understanding this truth, really truly. Now, the, the phrase, we reap what we sow, is something that we have heard for many, many years. But if we truly believed and understood this truth, it will greatly affect how we think and how we live. Through this book of Hosea, I want to share with you the four fundamental truths about sowing or planting. Number one, the first truth is you reap what you sow or you harvest what you plant. You plant beans, you will harvest beans. You plant melons, you will harvest melons. Second, second truth is you never sow mixed seeds. You don't mix multiple seeds. I'll explain that more later on. Number three, you can't reap if you don't sow. Now, all these things you're saying, Pastor Paul, this is like common sense. It is common sense. I've always said in the past that Bible is really a book of common sense that many of us lack. The fourth truth is reaping is proportionate to how much you sow. Reaping is proportionate to how much you sow. Again, the first one that I share with you, you reap what you sow, is something that we've heard over and over. And this is not just a Bible saying, this is true no matter where you are. Why? Because this is God's truth. So people discover that. You reap what you sow. One of my favorite verses, in fact, this is my life verse. Life verse means that you pick one verse in the Bible that really you try to live by as much as you can. Not that that's the only verse, but that a verse that is special to you. Galatians 6, 7, and 8, it says, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. 
This passage clearly speaks the two undeniable truths. Number one, God sees everything and God knows everything. And that there's nothing that we can do is hidden from God. God sees everything, God knows everything. And second thing is, because God sees and knows all these things, we cannot deceive God, therefore we'll always get what we deserve. In the end, we will always get what we deserve. Hosea 8.7 says, They have planned the wind and will harvest the whirlwind. You reap what you sow. I don't know. Let me, you know, see a, let me see a show of hands. How many of you guys have seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Anybody? Not too many. Oh, my God. This is a, it's a timeless classic. It's a Wonderful Life. In fact, if you watch, if you enjoy television, during Christmas time, honestly, just turn on any television station, and that movie is showing in America. It's called It's a Wonderful Life. Let me just kind of give you a brief synopsis of what the story is about. It's the story of a man who devoted his entire life helping friends and people around him, even at the sake of sacrificing his own needs and wants. But one day, due to the mistake of someone not of his own, he got into a huge financial bind, and unless he, had, unless he paid back thousands of dollars, which he didn't have, he would end up in jail. And this man was distraught. He said to himself, God, all my life, all my life, I work to help people. I work to serve people. And where am I? Where are you? Well, let me just say the story concludes in this, where in this man's lowest point, lowest situation, most dire situation, what happened was that the entire town, the entire community, the people around him came all together to contribute money and to help and support this man. And upon, in that moment, this man realized that all the years of his hard work just simply helping people and loving people, that he was not a waste, that he did not go unnoticed by God. And he was at that moment that he realized, truly, a man reaps what he sows. Another all-time classic, and actually I saw uh, this play recently uh, at TCIS, by, performed by a couple of our, I'm sorry, three of our students sitting over there. It's called The Christmas Story. Again, let me share with you a brief synopsis of this story. It's a story about a man who spent his whole life devoted only to himself. And on the day of his death and funeral, this man was greatly saddened and humbled to see that only a handful of his relatives were present for his funeral. Again, at that moment, he realized, you reap what you sow. You harvest what you plant. Even though these two stories are fiction, it clearly depicts God's law of causation. We reap what we sow. When we do good, good things will happen to us. When we give, it will be given back to us. That is God's law. With that being said, there's another thing that we need to keep in mind, and which leads to the second point, and that is that we should never sow mixed seeds. Too often we try to sow the seed, sow a good seed, try to plant good seeds to the ground. But at the same time, many of us, we try to we lead a double life. While we're sowing a seed here, we're sowing a different type of seed in another ground, in another place. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9, it says, You must not plant any other crop between the rows of your vineyard. If you do, you are forbidden to use either the grapes from the vineyard or the other crop. It simply means is this, that as Christians, we need to be careful of leading a double life. What I mean by that is, as Christians especially, we try to do good things. Why? Because we love God. 
Because God has been so good to us, we want to express that goodness to others. But then for some of us, maybe even many of us, there's a darker side. And the darker side wants to sow a different seed, wants to plant a different types of seed. What that means is this. We may be planting good seeds. Even if we're planting, you know, a huge field with good seeds, it doesn't matter if we're at the same time planting evil seeds. You know, when I share stories with you, oftentimes I share stories of athletes, and there's a reason why. I'm a big sports fan, so I know a lot of stories about athletes. And sadly, in America, there's this one particular athlete. He's in the news quite often nowadays. His name is, he's a famous baseball player. He's, some people say he's maybe the, the greatest pitcher of all times. And his name is Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens is, is about 44, something like that. And he's well respected, not only because of his ability, because throughout his career as a baseball player, he's also developed a reputation of being a good husband and a good father. Oftentimes you see on television, you know, Roger Clemens, you know, even though he may be busy with his baseball career, sometimes you often see him going to his son's football games and baseball games. And you always see him talking about the responsibility of a father and the responsibility of a husband. And oftentimes you see him away on family vacation saying, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pitch. You know, he said, I'm going to work in Houston simply because I want to be more devoted to my family. And so he took a huge pay cut to play somewhere else so that he can be closer to his family. So you see all these things and images on television and you say to yourself, wow, he is a good man. He is a good husband and he is a good father. But recently, due to different types of... Uh, uh, different events, uh, another part of his life came to light. And that was the fact that over the 20-some years of his baseball career, not all of it, but on part of that, his years in baseball, he sowed a different seed. While he was home, he was a good father and he was a good husband. But it was also discovered that while he was on the road, playing away at different cities, he was keeping a secret affair with another woman for several years. And that news recently came to light. And that news nearly destroyed his family, his relationship with his wife, the respect of his children. For 40 years he lived this life, and for close to 20 years, he lived a life. He sowed the seed of being a good father and a good husband. But what Roger Clemens did was that he fell into sin and he fell into temptation. And at the same time, he planted a different seed. You see, the Bible teaches us that we need to be careful. That it is, it is good and it is important to sow a good seed, plant a good seed. But you cannot mix those seeds. You cannot mix the good with the evil. Because ultimately the evil seed will end up consuming the good seed. Many of us, we're good husbands, good fathers, good children, good parents, good workers. And I look at all of you and I'm really, I'm honored to be in your presence. I don't know you well. But what I do know is all of you are great people. But within every one of us, there's this evil desire. A desire to plant and sow evil desire seeds, desiring seeds. But I'm telling you, God cannot be deceived. God cannot be mocked. In the end, we reap what we sow. And if we plant, if we reap two different types of seed, ultimately the evil one, will overwhelm and overcome the good seeds. So the second truth is, we must sow just one seed, one type of seeds, one kinds of seeds. 
And the third truth that I want to share with you is so, it is such a common sense statement. But I say this simply because we don't think about it enough. And that is, third truth is that you cannot reap if you do not sow. You cannot harvest if you do not plant. And the reason why I mention this is this. Believe it or not, there are people living all over the world, maybe even in this, in this, in this church. Too many of us, we want to reap. We want good things to happen to us. We want good people to be around us. We want good things all around us. And yet we don't plant. We expect these things without planting. And I don't know why. And I think oftentimes people use this as a, as a cheap grace. We just believe just because our God is such a loving God and we are His children, we just simply believe good things are going to automatically happen to us. It doesn't. Some good things will happen out of God's grace. But a lot of good things happen only when we plant. But too often we live our lives. We say to ourselves, you know what? I want my boss to be nice to me. Even though we are not nice to our subordinates. We want people, our friends, to be nice to us. Remember us. While at the same time, we are not good friends to other people. We want our spouse to be loving to us. While at the same time, we are not loving to our spouses. See, even though this is a very common sense statement, believe it or not, too many of us, we live our lives wanting to harvest without planting the seed first. If you want your children to be good children, like Hannah Munson, two times I've said nice things to her about her back to back then you must, if you want her to be nice to you, then you have to be a good parent. You cannot expect to harvest without planting the seed. If you want your wife to be nice to you, then you first have to plant the seed of being a good husband. Please tell that to your husbands you know, tonight. If you want this church to be a blessing, then you have to first plant the seed, sow a seed of service to this church. Again, it's a common sense thing, but too often we live our lives wanting to harvest without planting. And we have to think about that. Before we expect good things to happen to us, ask ourselves, have we done good things? Have we planted? Have we sowed? Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4 through 6 says, Farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of the tiny baby growing in his mother's womb, so you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. Plant your seed in the morning, keep busy all afternoon, for you don't know if, if profit will come from one activity or another, or maybe both. This passage is speaking about people who are making excuses as to why they're not sowing. Some people, they say they don't want to sow because they're waiting for the most ideal situation. Say, oh, you know, I cannot sow. The weather doesn't look too good right now. It's a little bit windy right now. It's a little bit dry. Other people, they don't want to harvest. Again, because they're waiting for the perfect timing. It says, you know what? I don't want to harvest right now. It, looks, it feels like rain. I see clouds coming. The Bible says you don't know God's way, God's plan, and God's timing. You plant when you can plant. If you can plant today, you plant today. If you can harvest today, then you harvest today. Only God knows our future. And our job is to plant and sow whenever we can, whenever possible. Too often we use excuses like, I will serve God if. I will give money if. I will invest time if. I will help the poor people when. I will, I will spend time with children when. I will serve God if. That's us trying to look for the ideal situation, ideal time. And what God is saying, your ideal time is right now. Solomon teaches that if you wait too long, then you will miss the harvest. You know, I just found out, you know, um, the Lee's family, they're from Sacramento. They lived there, I think, for 16 years or something like that. Well, you know, Houston is the place that I called home for 25 years. I grew up there. I served there. And for eight years, I was also a pastor at a church in Houston. 
And let me just say that it wasn't really, it wasn't easy. It was good. I, I don't want to say anything negative about my experience in Houston. It was good, but, you know, it was hard. There are many nights, many broken hearts, many missed birthdays of my children because I was away on mission trips, many weeks away from home, not being able to help my wife with, you know, raising our children. But I gladly did it out of obedience to God. But at the same time, oftentimes I said to myself, is this really worth it? Does anyone really appreciate what I'm doing? Even though that was irrelevant, I did this simply because out of obedience to God. But sometimes as a human being, I say to myself, is this all worth it? Does anyone really appreciate what I'm doing? I am planting all these good seeds, but is this worth it? Well, this past summer, I had a chance to go back home to Houston. Uh, first time in two years, I came out to Korea, and in two years, I had a chance to go back home. And, you know, through the, the magic of the Internet, uh, through Facebook, some of the kids found out that I was going back home. And when they found out that I was going back home, they immediately said, Pastor Paul, some of my past disciples, they said, Pastor Paul, you're coming? We have to get together. So, some say, and so my past disciple, you know, they're all like college students now. They say, you know, we're going to get some of, the, some of our friends together, and let's get together. So originally the plan was about 10 of my former students, some have graduated, some are like juniors and seniors. They were saying, let's get together, and about 10 of us. Well, about 10 days leading up to our trip to Houston, somehow this one person, my point of contact, she emailed me saying, Pastor Paul, oh, I think... Some other people found out that you're coming, and I think the number is going to be more like 20. So I said, okay, instead of meeting at a restaurant, okay, let's meet at my brother's house. Because, you know, 20 people is a lot. And the day that we left Korea to, you know, fly to Houston, she left a message on my Facebook and saying, Pastor Paul, ooh, I think it's going to be more than 30, maybe even higher, you know, than 30 plus. So we left. We flew to Houston. And as soon as we left Houston, you know, it was my mother's 70th birthday, so all the family members got together, and we went on a cruise. And when you're on a cruise, you can't check the Internet. And the day that we were supposed to meet together was the day that we come back from the cruise. So we come back, came back from the cruise like around noon, and then we are supposed to have this meeting at my brother's house at 4 o'clock that afternoon. What originally began as about 10 of us wanting to get together just to reminisce that number grew 20, 30. On that afternoon, I had over 60 people come visit me to want to meet me and to get together with me. And let me just say that that moment was really uh, somewhat overwhelming for me because I never expected that many people to come to see me, make time to see me. And all these people, and some of these people no longer go to the church that I served at. And about a, more than a dozen people came, drove all the way down from Austin just to see me. And it was at that moment, I, found, I sensed this great sense of gratitude toward God. And I, I realized, it was truly, God cannot be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And I realized that all those years of loving these people, helping them, praying for them. He came back to me. It was such a, just a profound moment of humbling moment, also a grateful moment. You know, as a, being a pastor, it's wonderful, but not only being a pastor, but I sense this every day, every moment of my life. During this Lunar New Year's holiday, again, I get an email from India saying, Pastor Paul, Happy New Year's. <laughs> First email wishing me Happy Lunar New Year's holiday. I've been to China about three times. I know Luke just came back from there. And the three times that I visited China, I, we went there to help, uh, to do English camp, to help these people. I still get emails from these students still asking me, when am I, when am I going to come and visit them? This is God's law. We reap what we sow. When we plant, we harvest. It is simply God's law. And the reason why I say to you is this, 
so that you will not be discouraged in doing what is good because God sees all and God knows all. And lastly, I want to share with you the last truth is that we reap proportionate to what we sow. That means that if you plant a lot, then you're going to harvest a lot. If you love a lot, that much love will be returned to you. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, 7 says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 it says, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. For my dear Canadian friends, it's a story from Canada. In Canada, a believer, this Christian, operates a large grain farm. And he spread uh, his you know, ownership includes some 2,500 acres. You know, Canada, there's lots of land. And one day he was asked how he planted the seeds in his large amount of land. Upon hearing that question, he pointed to this a machine, a huge tractor type of distributing machine, and says, which is about 30 feet wide. He says, we take that double tandem truck, fill it with a certified seed, and we back it up to the distributor and, and back it up to the distributor, open the slots and pour in the seeds. And he went on to say that if you're ever going to and he went on to say this, he says, if you're ever going to be cheap, he says, Don't be cheap with the seed. Because he said, one bushel of seed invested yields thirty bushels of grain harvested in a good year. Thirty one good seed produced 30 bushels. So he said, you know what? If you're going to be cheap, but don't ever be cheap with a seed. If you give good quality, you're going to, you know, the amount that's going to be returned to you will be that much more. When you sow, sow a good seed. Don't be cheap in sowing. If a friend is saying, oh, I'm hungry, really? Well, you know what? They have a you know, 701 triangular you know, kimbap thing, even though you have 10,001 in your wallet. If you have a friend who, you know, who maybe needs a loan, you know, needs a loan you know, don't say, well, you know, I, here's a 10,001. Someone needs help with moving, and you say, oh, you know, I can only help for five minutes. That's just an illustration. That's just an example. But when you want to sow a seed, of good deeds. If you want to sow a seed of love, you can be cheap with other things. You can be cheap with yourself, but don't be cheap in sowing the seed of love. Because if you plant and if you sow a good seed, Bible says, example, it'll, you know, it'll return to you maybe 30-fold. Let me close with one final story. In 1939, I think most of you know this story, when a war broke out in Europe, specifically in Poland, an opportunistic businessman, a very savvy and smart businessman named Oskar Schindler, decided to use this opportunity to become wealthy. Because when he saw all these Jewish people being imprisoned, immediately he thought to, thought to himself, cheap labor. So he made a deal with the uh, a German army officer to hire these Jewish people as his worker at his factory, at his plant. And for a while, he made very good money. He made lots of money. But over time, as time went by, he began to see these very Jewish workers and friends of these Jewish workers that he had being slaughtered by the thousands. And upon witnessing that atrocity, Oscar Schindler decided that he wasn't going to use his influence to save as many Jewish lives as possible. 
Oskar Schindler could have easily just turned the other cheek, like many other people back then. But for him, he decided that that's not him. So by war's end, the story goes on to tell us, tell us that Oskar Schindler has used, had used up his entire fortune to maintain the lives of nearly 1,200 Jewish workers at his factory. And through his selfless work, Oskar Schindler is revered by the many thousands of descendants of the lives that he saved. Nobody knows for sure, but they say the descendants of Oscar Schindler, the lives that he saved, number close to 6,000. 6,000 lives. And the reason why Oscar Schindler was able to save this many lives was because he knew when he came to planting the seed of saving lives and serving others, he wasn't cheap. He devoted his entire fortune. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. I am not a good man in a sense. I have many weaknesses, I have many faults. But one thing that I do know in the bottom of my heart is that God sees all and God knows all. And I believe in the bottom of my heart that God rewards those who serve Him and obey Him. And I know that, that in the end when I give, that much more will be returned to me. And because I have that truth in my heart, I do my best to live my life, live my life, trying to sow a good seed as much as I can. And I just want to encourage all of you and challenge all of you. It's still January of 2009. That many of you guys are already working hard and serving and doing good deeds. And I just wanted to encourage you tonight. Don't grow tired or don't be weary in doing good or serving or obeying God. Because God is watching and He knows and He will reward you accordingly. A man reaps what he sows. Amen? Let us pray.